Okay. Hello there, everybody. Um, this is a class on the Oyo Podrida. Um, as with many early modern Spanish things, it is useful to start with a quote from Don Quixote. So, um, that big dish is smoking farther off, said Sancho. Seems to me to be an Oyo Podrida. And out of the diversity of things in such oyas, I cannot fail to light upon something tasty and good for me. And we all know what a connoisseur of uh, culinary pleasures Sancho Panza was. So he liked it. And I hope that you will like it as well. Um, Oyo Podrida is the proper Spanish pronunciation of the name of this dish. However, Sometimes I will probably slip because English is my first language and say olla podrida. Pollo podrida was a fashionable dish during the Habsburg monarchy. In the 17th century, it represented the culinary taste of nobles, both for its ostentation and its opulence. Yet everyone from kings to canons, directors and peasants enjoyed it. Although its beginnings as a simpler stew with humbler ingredients is generally agreed upon, no one really knows its point of origin. Some postulate it was Gallic, others Visigothic in origin, while others theorize that the oro podrida comes from the du Jewish dish adafino, a stew prepared on Fridays to avoid cooking on the Sabbath. In the Book of Good Love, by Juan Ruiz, the Archpriest of Hita, um, which was uh, published in 1330. Uh, he mentions it, it is a complete meal that the Jews prepared for the Sabbath. Christians could also have added, have added dish, had the dish, but added pork, because this way you can tell that the person eating it is a Christian rather than a Jew, which in Spain, particularly early modern Spain, mattered. Um, but the uh, in the Book of Good Love, they talk about it as follows. Some men content, them, content themselves at home with one or two sardines, but when they eat with others, then they have greater appetite. And then they have mutton or adafinas, a stew made by Jews, or say they'll eat no bacon unless it is cooked with squab and greens. Um, all of those things sound yummy. I like sardines. I like greens and squabs and muttons. And this, this stew sounds good too. So all yummy things. Uh, the origin of the word adafina is not exactly known. It is most accepted interpretation is that it comes from the Spanish Arabic word adadafina, which derives from classical Arabic word dafina, meaning hidden or buried. This etymology makes sense since an adafina was set to cook overnight on the hearth without further inter intervention. It was covered in the embers and set or set up uh, next to the fire of glowing coals and left to slow cook until the time for the meal. Um, Sephardic Jews in Morocco still prepare their adafinas in this way. Adafinas were as varied as the households and towns of Spain. Common ingredients were legumes, such as chickpeas and fava beans. Um, for those who don't know, all other kinds of beans um, are from the New World. Um, all beans are legumes, not all legumes are beans. Um, vegetables and, if one's purse permitted, some meat. In some cases, the main protein appeared to in the form of eggs. Huevos hamandados refer to eggs that went into the arafina as the main ingredient. When slow cooked overnight in the pot with the other ingredients, the eggs take a velvety and creamy texture, which is different from regular hard boiled eggs. Um, there is uh, in the Inquisition records in Toledo in 1580, Ana Lopez used to spy on the Converso family of Diego Enriquez uh, through the hole in the door, the hole in the door for the cat. Uh, she saw them make an adafina of meat and parsley, onions, cabbage, and mint. I personally am not overly fond of mint, but otherwise, 
that sounds like a tasty stew. Okay, Wanda, um, we had a question, if I may. Sure. And there was a question about if there will be a handout with the recipe. And it, I believe that your handouts are in the Google Drive for the My event. handouts are in the Google Drive. The Google Drive, what I put in there is the uh, spreadsheet of all 13 recipes. Um, it, that includes the complete recipe or description for all of the 13 I found. And also... Um, data analysis, breaking out the different types of ingredients uh, across that set of, of recipes. The other handout in there is the list of my sources for all of this information. So you can check up on it and delve more deeply into things if you like. So yes, uh, it's in the Google Drive. Um, anyway, the easiest way to Christianize the Adafino was to add pork. All of the recipes and descriptions I found include pork in some form. The advantage of a family-sized meal, slow cook in a single pot, was not lost on the Christians either. Uh, Spanish soup is a stew that was popular throughout southern Germany and northeastern Switzerland in the 16th and 17th century. Before church on a Sunday, this pre-cooked dish was placed on the hot embers in the hearth or in the tiled oven, um, which would simmer for an hour or two. And the advantage of this was that the maid could also go along to church to hear the sermon along with the family. She didn't have to stay home and cook the uh, Sunday meal. Um, at each table throughout Spain, ingredients for the stew, for the olla podrida, would invariably change depending on the area, the season, and the economic level of those cooking. But in the 16th century, the Oro Podrida becomes the fashion among the aristocracy and for three centuries is served from the richest tables to the poorest. Recipes could vary from one, cooked, from one cook to the next, but all agreed that the ingredients must be many and varied. Um, the Oro Podrida is the, um, ancestor of the modern Spanish dish, uh, cocido. Um, again, we go back to Don Quixote. There's this section where we talk about, um, this is um, this is Sancho again, because most of the food things in Don Quixote are from Sancho rather, from, rather than uh, from Senor Quijana. With this, the governor was satisf satisfied and looked forward to the approach of night and supper time with great anxiety. And though time to his mind stood still and made no progress, nevertheless, the hour he so longed for came and they gave him a beef salad with onions and some boiled calves feet, rather far, calves feet rather far gone. At this, he fell to the greater, with greater relish than if he had been given him Franklin's of Milan, pheasants of Rome, veal from Sorrento, partridges from Maron, or geese from Lavajos. Those are all fancy things, yummy fancy things. And turning to the doctor at supper, he said to him, look here, senor doctor, for the future, don't trouble yourself about giving me dainty things or choice dishes to eat for it will only be taking my stomach off its hinges. It is accustomed to goat, cow, bacon, hung beef, turnips, and onions. And if by any chance it is given these palace dishes, it receives them squeamishly and sometimes with loathing. What the head carver had best do is serve me what they call oro podridas, and the rottener they are, the better they smell. And he can put whatever he likes in them, so long it is good to eat, and I'll be obliged to him and will requite him someday. Now, the reference to, to the rottener they are, the better they smell. Um, podridas means rotten. So an oro podrida means a rotten pot. Um, but most likely it is not rotten as in spoiled. It is more likely that this means rotten, um, as in long cooked, 
uh, rotten, like fermented things. Fermented things are to some, in some sense, long cooked. They're cooked through the fermentation rather than fire, but it's that connotation rather than spoiled, yucky garbage. This, this dish is not spoiled, yucky garbage. Um, the Oro Podrida is one of Spain's rich gastronomic contributions to Europe. Culinary giants like Carême and Escoffier mention that the Oro Podrida is Spain's first national dish to influence other European cooking. Whatever its exact origin, the rotten pot began to appear in Castilian literature in the mid 16th century as a symbol of rich, of rich food. Such a dish could not go unnoticed and was soon known throughout Europe, thanks to the relevance and expansion of the Spanish empire. The rotten pot appeared in foreign recipes. In uh, 1570, Bartolomeo Scapi, cook of Pope Pius V, included it in his famous opera. Scholars speculate that Scapi became aware of this stew when he prepared the banquet for Carlos for Charles V, also known as Carlos I to us Spaniards, um, his coronation feast. Olo Podrida found its way to the court in Vienna as olio soup, to France as, a, as potpourri, and to northeastern Switzerland as Spanish soup, which I mentioned earlier. Um, at around the same time as Spanish fashion began to spread throughout Europe. The Spanish name Olo Podrida means something like rotten pot, Talk about that part um, in the sense of long cooked. Um, let's see, the name misconstrued in Spain itself as rotten pot was then translated literally by the French as potpourri. Given the many different ingredients, the French name for the stew acquired the tr um, and transferred the meaning of mishmash and utter, utter, ultimately. <laughs> Untied and start over. Ultimately, potpourri in the sense of a musical medley. Now, the recipes that I have found are from Spain. The earliest one I found was Spain from 1563. Um, 1563 is not necessarily the date the book was published, but it is the death date of the author, the actual publishing date of the book. I don't know. And that is uh, the Regalo de la Vida Humana by Juan Vélez. Um, that's the earliest one I could find. And then as mentioned before, in Italy, 1570, Bartolomeo Scappi, um, and he describes the dish. To prepare a dish of various ingredients called in Spanish, oro podrida. So even though this is an Italian book, he specifically mentions this as a Spanish dish. Um, then there's also one in uh, 1581 in Germany, in Rumpolz, Ein Nukokobok. Um, this one is huge. There are 90 different ingredients listed in this recipe. It goes on and on and on. Um, then again, there's another Spanish recipe in 1599, Diego Granado. Um, and for those of you who stick very strictly to the 1600 cutoff date for the SCA, well, then you stop there. Uh, but for those of us who are a little bit more flexible, um, it's also in the Science of Cooking from Transylvania in 1603. Um, it is in the Ouverture de Cuisine by Lancelot de Casto from Belgium in 1604. Uh, Casto describes it as to make a potpourri called oila podrida in Spanish. That is how he describes the recipe. Um, one, we, one. Had a, we had another question come up. Yes. yes. So this is from Magda. And she said, I think I know this dis dish as cholent. Are they related or is it just me? And not the fermented bit, but the overnight bake in the hearth. Um, I am not familiar with cholent, so maybe. Um, cholent, uh, is that is that a, um, a dish uh, from the Jewish culinary uh, traditions? 
because that may be related to the Adafina, which... Yeah, it's a Sabbath dish. Oh, okay. So then, yeah, it's probably a form of the of Adafina, which is the origin or a likely origin of an olea podrida. Because stews, you know, stews are stews are stews in, in to some to some extent. Um, there are certain things that make a particular stew that dish. Um, so but stewing meat and vegetables together is a fairly universal thing for most people who cook food because it's so easy and well you have all the things but this one has a large variety of things okay back to my notes um it's okay i don't mind being sidetracked sidetracked is fine because questions are good uh let's see we talked about uh pesto on to 1607 Domingo Hernandez de Maceas in his Libro del Art Cuisina uh, has a, has one uh, in another Spanish one in 1611 in Martez Montillo. Um, the Martez Montillo 1611 culinary manuscript is in the process of being translated um, by Professor Carolyn Nadeau, who was the keynote at West Coast Culinary a couple of years ago. Um, she says she's going to try and finish off her translation as her summer project. So one of these days we'll actually get another book to cook from, yay! Um, <laughs> onward. Uh, there's a, in 1612, there is a Dutch translation of Scopi by Antonius Magrias. Um, and since Scopi included in Ola Podrida, so did Magnus. Uh, England, 1615, Gervais Markham's English housewife has a dish that he describes as to make an excellent, excellent oli pottage, which is the only principal dish of boiled meat, which is esteemed in all of Spain. Um, then Italy, 1623, excuse me, um, Mattia Geiger, published a treatise on serving called Lo Scalo, which is the steward, uh, where he describes, um, has a bit of a description of an Olo Podrida. Um, another, back to England in 1660, the accomplished cook by Robert May has a recipe and also uh, England, 1669, the closet of Ken Holm Digby. So those are the 13 recipes or descriptions because not all of them have actual recipes. Some of them, I just have some references. Um, an ola podrida. Now, why do you want to cook one of these? Besides the fact that it's period food and period food is yummy. Um, you can't make one for one person. I wouldn't make one of these for a crowd of less than 10 people. But if you have a large group of omnivores. It is an excellent dish to serve. All of the various things are cooked together in one pot, which is why you need omnivores. If you have picky eaters who say, oh, I don't want this to touch that, and I don't want this to touch that, or I'm vegetarian, so don't cook the meat with my vegetables, or I don't like pigs, or I don't like chickens, or I don't like lambs, whatever. Any of those sorts of picky people who I'm sure are very nice people, but I don't necessarily want to feed them and certainly not this dish. This doesn't work. But big group omnivores, serve them this. All the things are cooked together in one pot. They are then usually served out as three dishes. So one pot cooking pot to wash, but three dishes to put on the table. You take a, you have a platter where you take all of the meats, and put them on a platter and serve that. Another platter, you take all the vegetables, put them on that and serve that. And then you have this beautiful broth to serve that. So you have a meat platter, a veggie platter, and a really good soup. It all came out of one pot. This is really great, particularly if you have a lot of people to feed, works for a feast, works for your, your group that you're camping with, um, if you're doing it at a camp, um, 
do it when you have a wood or charcoal fire you can do because this is a long cook thing. So not over your Coleman or your propane because you'll use up all your fuel. But if you have um, a facility for cooking over fire or over charcoal for a long time, and just one person paying attention because don't leave the fire unattended, um, you can feed the whole camp of not picky eaters. Um, or if you're doing for feast, this can be an entire course for your feast. You do an oil quadrita and maybe some pickles and cheese, mustard, and there's a whole course right there. Onward, you can do fancier things for the next course after everybody's not hungry anymore and they are ready to have the fancy little tidbits. Um, so that is why you want to do this because it's easy and feeds a lot of people and it's tasty. Now, as I said, the serving part of this is what is really what makes this different from a, an average stew is that you serve out the different parts separately when you cook them together. Now, the various period recipes have different notes on the serving. Um, Scopy says, then set out great platters and put part of the mixture on them without the broth. Get all the large fowl quartered and the large meats and the salami sliced, leaving the small birds whole. Divvy those up under platters over them, that mixture. On top of that, put some of the other mixture of the saveloy cut into pieces. Saveloy is a kind of sausage. Um, make three, three layers like that. Get a spoonful of the fattest broth and splash it over the top. Cover everything over with another platter and let it sit in a warm place for half an hour. To serve it hot with mild spices over the top. That preparation is more common in the winter than at any other time. Because it's winter, you want to serve your food hotter because it's cold. Um, and Rumpel, after his list of 90 ingredients, I mean, really, it's just exhausting. He says, and when it is served, so take the beef, chicken, and capon broth that has been lightly salted and pour it through a hair sieve. So the soup is not lumpy soup. It's not creamy soup. It's more broth or consomme because it's, it's run through a sieve. So it's just broth. Um, Granado, the fellow from 1599, will say, just squeak onto the line, yes, yay. Um, put some of this mixture upon the plates without broth and take all the birds divided in four quarters and the salted meats cut into slices and leave the little birds whole. See, there's another thing, leaving the little birds whole because they're, they're king, you don't want to cut them up. And distribute them on a plate upon the mixture and upon those put the other mixture with sliced stuffing and in this manner, make three layers and take a ladle full of the fattest broth and put it on top. Cover it with another plate and leave it for half an hour until hot. Now remember, the, the uh, rules about copyright, <laughs> you didn't have them then. So there was a lot of copying. And when you're doing the same dish in one cookbook and another cookbook and another cookbook, sometimes you're gonna steal what the other guy said. So. Granado is copying, he's obviously copying a lot of squat, what Scoppy was saying. This was okay, they got away with it. Uh, let's see, Casto, our Belgian friend, who my downstairs neighbor, Master Wolfric, refers to as just that butter, because in a lot of his recipes, extra butter, um, which is good. We all like butter, it's yummy, it stays with us forever. Um, when it is cooked enough, remove it and put it into separate plates. Take a very large plate and dress the meats between the ones with the others. Then the halves of maizine that you have put on the plate and one here and the other there and the boiled raviolis must be moistened with fat broth. This one has raviolis in it. Oh, yum, yum. And sprinkle thereon with cinnamon and parmesan and put them in plates here and there and the other raviolis similarly. And then that which you have in the little pot, put each sort separately in a plate, the bologna sausage 
also here and there, and then have little guinea fowl roasted and well larded, a dozen little birds also roasted. Put them in the middle of the plate thereon and look well the placing you choose that one can see them, and then take a dozen feet of sheep well washed and put them around the plate, and then take a pound of dates cooked with wine and sugar and put them with a spoon and put them between the sheep's feet. After Take the broth from your pot and chafe it very hot and cast thereon without it, moistening the roast and raviolis and serve so. So you've got, you've cooked um, sheep's feet and you put them around your platter. And in between, you put the cooked dates and you, and this is on the top of the platter. So you've got this giant mountain of food and you have these decoratively arranged bits of the food that are, you know, kind of showy. Well, you may not think that sheep meat are a tasty thing, but we have a different aesthetic than the people in period. And the sheep feet were probably quite yummy, but they're also very showy on this giant platter of food. Um, let's see, and Maceris uh, says, make plates of it with mustard and some other and on top of the plates, cast parsley because it looks nice and is very good. So here we have somebody, an early modern guy, garnishing with parsley, just like you know modern restaurants. You know, put a little parsley there on the plate. Nothing's new. Um, Martínez Montiel, the one I told you that the translation's coming. Uh, he takes an interesting approach. He makes a giant pie out of all of this stuff. Put all the ingredients in bowls, each one separate from the other, and the vegetables in another bowl, and don't let anything fall apart. Let them cool. Make a big, thick crust with rye or whole wheat dough. Place it on a baking sheet and fill the pie with all the cooked ingredients. Season with all spices and caraway. Add in all the vegetables, no more, no less. When the pie is full, seal it and place it in the bread oven because no copper oven would be able to hold it. This is a giant pie. Place it on the copper baking sheet and don't remove it from the sheet until it is done baking. When the crust is half baked, stick a needle in the top and fill it with the stock and let it continue baking in the oven for an hour. So you have a vent hole in the top of your pie and halfway through the cooking of the pie, you pour the stock in because you had your, and remember, you have your meats, you have your veggies, and you have your stock. Um, there's a, I will put it in the chat. There's a guy who, in Spain, who does these really cool videos of, um, of doing very food reconstructions. And he did this particular pie thing. Add. And we did have a comment. Um, we we did have a comment that said, I thought just add butter was Vereen, and that is from Eden of Lion's Garden. No, just add butter is is overture. Just add butter is overture to cuisine. Um, I mean, Lancelot de Custo, uh, Casto was the cook for three successive prince bishops of Liege in a fairly short period of time. These prince bishops ate well and died happy <laughs> because they had all the spider. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see, serving instructions from Mark. Uh, he says, then the dish, then put the dish upon great chargers or long Spanish dishes made in the fashion of our English wooden trays with a good store of sippets in the bottom. Sippets are little bits of bread. Then cover the meat all over with prunes, raisins, currants, and blanched almonds, boiled in a thing by themselves, and then color the cover the fruit and the whole boiled herbs and the herbs with slices of oranges and lemons, and lay the roots around about the sides of the dish and strew good store of sugar over all of it and serve it forth. So Markham's recipe has a lot more fruit 
picked and everybody else has got prunes, raisins, currants, oranges, lemons. Um, most of the others don't have a lot of fruit. Um, but he's English. What is he? I suppose fruit you stew can be good. Um, and the Geiger was writing about was writing a serving manual rather than a cookbook. He organizes the dishes that were to be served seasonally and places what he calls the oglia podrida as the third course among those things that are served in the wintertime. So this is all of the 13 recipes. And I've divided them up by ingredient, ingredient categories with meat, we have lamb, pork, beef, veal, sausage, and then game. Poultry of various sorts, veggies of various sorts, grains, bread, pasta, nuts, fruit, fats, and spices or other flavorings, and dairy and eggs. And then at the bottom, we have the actual whole recipes. This is what is in the handout in the Google Drive. So if I zip through things too fast, you can take your time and look at it from the Google Drive. So the first one, we have mutton and various piggy parts, the ears and the head and the trotters. Um, and then sausage, we have longanzia and um, bishop stuffed with pork meat. Now, I know in another period Spanish book, a stuffed bishop is a kind of sausage, which is why I put that in the sausage search. Um, and then it's also got capon and dove and cabbage and turnips. Cabbage and turnips are the most common of the veggies that go in these things. Um, the, um, the one from uh, Juan Velez is a fairly short recipe. Let's go down here where you can see the whole recipe. So you can see, see, this is short. The next one is Escapis. His is very long. He says a lot of things. Then this one, this is the German one. The German one goes on forever. It's huge. Um, it has lots and lots of different things. Um, we have, some of them have garlic, some have onions, uh, some have beans. Uh, we have various sorts of, turnips are called out as turnips fairly often, but there are other various roots across the uh, the whole selection of recipes. We have kohlrabi, parsnips, rutabagas. Um, and various kinds of sausage, various kinds of little birds. We get a fair amount of chickens, capons, hens. I've put them all together. Um, doves, partridges, pheasants, ducks, and little birds. Lots and lots of little birds, which for those of us in the US is somewhat problematic because most songbirds are protected, except for starlings. The starlings are an invasive species, so eat them up. Um, but you can, you know, Put in quail. Quail seem quail is the for me anyway the easiest small bird to find in the grocery store. Just I live in a city. I don't live in a rural area where I can just you know get starlings or other little birds, whichever little birds might be legal. Um, there's a fair amount of lamb, but there's pork in all of them, and in various parts of the piggy because you know you can eat everything except the squeal. Um, pigs ears, pigs heads, pigs feet. Um, if you don't like pigs, you're not going to eat an ala potrida. Um, some beef, uh, some veal, sausages, lots of different sorts of sausages. Some I think are fresh, some I think are cured. Um, but sausages are common. They are not in all of them, but they are in many of them. The only thing that's in everything is piggies. Piggy parts are in everything because in late period Spain, being signaling that you were a Christian as opposed to being Jewish or Muslim was very, very important. Very important. 
like you don't want to be burned at the stake, important, <laughs> seriously important. And one way to signal that you were Christian or that you had converted from being a Jew or a Muslim and weren't that, and you were not one of them anymore. You are a Christian. That's important. It's good. One way of signaling that was to eat pig parts. So eating pig parts is a political statement as well as for those of us who like pig parts, a tasty thing to do. Um, which is why lard is one of the common um, cooking fats in Spain, because it's a holdover from that, from, well, I got a show that I don't want to be burnt. Um, okay, so we have um, Velez is short, Scapis is long, Rumpolz is the longest one. Rumpolz just goes on. But he's German, he's very thorough. Um, Granado, he's got mutton, he's got Different kinds of piggy parts. Um, the veal he's got is the kidneys, uh, sausages. He's got wild boar um, and and rabbit. Uh, capons, hens. This one's got is very poultry heavy. It's got pigeons and partridges and pheasants and ducks and thrushes and francolins. Francolins are little songbirds. And twenty quail. That's good. I like quail. Uh, and not so much on the veggies. He's got uh, cabbage and turnips and chickpeas. And I've obviously, I have made oro Puerto Rico several times. Um, the non root veg that goes into this, since it's a long cooking thing, they get kind of mushy. You kind of lose them into the, just the whole mass of stuff. So the cabbage, um, to some extent, the chickpeas, depending on whether you start out with cooked chickpeas or dried chickpeas. You start out with dried chickpeas and you cook them in the broth. Yeah. They stay a bit more, more whole. But the cabbage, you kind of just lose it into the goo of, yummy goo, but goo nevertheless, of this thing. So that's why there's a lot of roots, carrots, turnips, parsnips, things like that. And the onions. Um, sometimes they're cut up, but um, you can also just put whole onions in this thing and you're more likely to actually be able to distinguish that they are onions at the end. They are fully cooked and ready to eat, but you know what it is as opposed to just, oh, it's not the meat parts. It must be the veggie parts. I don't know what it is. So if you want to be able to tell what the individual ingredients are. Don't cut them up in little bits and use the roots or other hard things. This cabbage just sort of dissolves. Tasty, but it's not discernible. Um, we also have nuts in several of these. Uh, chestnuts most often, uh, but also pine nuts, pistachios, almonds. Um, some of these we get uh, spicing. Salt, and pepper, and cinnamon are the most common, but there are other things in there. Sometimes ginger, saffron. Uh, one of them has uh, capers, um, which would give you a bit of a more acidic, sharp bite because capers are generally pickled. Um, here's another one, bologna sausages and cooked mortadella. So these are both milder sausages as opposed to the you know hard cured kind of sausages. Um, but both cured sausages and fresh sausages went into these things. So you can see from looking at this, if I'm not zipping too quickly through it, wide variety. That is the key to an all Puerto is that there's a lot of different things in these in these dishes, lots and lots and lots of different things. So the variety of stuff must be pork and a lot of other things. And that you serve it generally, not always, but generally you serve it in separate parts are the distinguishing marks of this dish. And my kitty has just come up here and I'm trying to make sure she doesn't get on the table. Um, and the pig, remember, you can use all the parts. Use the ears, use the tongue. 
is uh, use the feet. Because remember, you're cooking this a long time. So those parts that are not so popular, um, but it are good when you braise them or cook them a long time, like the ears and the feet and all of those things. Because they just, they get much better. You don't quick cook those things. They're too much, there's too much cartilage in them or other overly chewy bits. Um, the Dutch one, since it's a translation of Scapi, that was one of them that I had. I didn't have a whole translation of his translation. I just had notes on where he's different from Scapi. So that's one reason why it doesn't say pork on this one, because it's assumed. It's all Scapi's recipe and the only notes on the Dutch one are where he's different. He uses blackbirds. Scapi does not use. And he uses dry peas instead of fresh peas. Scapi uses fresh peas. But Scapi's in Italy and this guy's in, you know, the Netherlands. So um, seasonality and where you're from and what economic level you are determines to a great degree what you're going to put into an all the podrida. But if you look through, the, through this spreadsheet in the handouts, you will see just tons and tons and tons of variety. So while I said this is for the not picky eaters, and I still maintain it is for the not picky eaters, there's still a lot, a lot of variety. So you can fit this to whatever it is you find in your garden, find in your grocery store, find in your freezer, um, and make one of these. This one, this is, yeah, this is Markham. Markham has potatoes. See, he has potato roots. Now, uh, sweet potatoes, white potatoes, I don't know. You can make arguments on both sides, probably. Or you can talk to um, Master Torvald, who has done a class on potatoes in period and probably has a learned opinion on this matter. Um, I do not have a learned opinion on this matter, so you can try it either way, sweet potatoes or white potatoes. Um, spinach, carrots. Yeah. On the, um, the spinach along with the and even the cabbages, one of those, it's going to just sort of push. And the lettuce, some of them have lettuce. They're going to just, you know, kind of dissolve this long cooking thing. Um, let's see. All the way to Digby. Digby's the last one. Digby's got, and his pig parts are bacon. I like pig parts, but that's the one they're going to eat. Uh, it's got veal and beef and capon and pigeons um, and cabbage and roots and garbanzos and garlic and onions and sweet herbs. So as, as you can see, lots of variety. Like I said, I'm just sort of zip zapping through this spreadsheet because to keep it, keep the text big enough to be readable, but also to include them all. There's a lot of swaying back and forth across the spreadsheet, which when I'm doing it and you're trying to read it is not the best thing, but that's why I put it in the handouts so you can look at it in detail at your leisure. What is your favorite one, Juana? Uh, my favorite one, well, I think just, Riffing on the theme rather than following a specific one. Though I do want to make the Martinez Montillo one that's a pie. But this isn't good pandemic food unless you live in a very large pod. Because like I said, you need a lot of people to eat one of these. Well, I suspect a pie would freeze. Yeah, it might. It might, but yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things I, I often think about making for the first night of the play date since we get there. The For those of you not on the West Coast, the Cook's play date at West Ontario War. 
my Lord and I get there a day ahead of everybody else in the play date group to set up our area. And I've, I have often thought, well, I should make it for the day when everybody else shows up because they're all you know, tired from travel and setting up camp that we did the day before. And this way everybody could just eat. But usually instead we just go off site because it's easier. And there was a question that came through in chat from Aisha. Does yes. everything go into the pot at the same time? Some of the ingredients you mentioned need a longer cooking time and some will fall apart before others are even close to being ready. Yes, there are uh, in the descriptions. Um, it varies as to what goes in in what order, but things do frequently go in uh, in different orders. Like you put the meats in first um, and you put the vegetables in later. Um, often the small birds or even some of the larger birds, if you've got them in the parts, are roasted and then put in the pot. Um, there is a great variety. Well, then I'm going to ask a question. So I have... Um, so I think you said cooking in a clay pot over a fire. And I imagine something like this would work in a tagine just fine. Yes. Where you, yep. Yes. Well, a tagine's a clay pot. Yep. So I'm excited to use mine again this summer. So. Yeah. The, the pot, I like to cook. I got this big giant uh, clay pot in Chinatown, um, it's got, it's a big clay pot, but it's got wires around it sort of to support it because it's so big. Um, which I don't generally take to take the play date because it's so big, but we've been going through our storage and I found it. Oh, that's my Ola Pot. Um, yeah, that's, but, I'm yeah. a... I'm a fan of Alton Brown cookbooks. And I think one thing he recommended is going to an Asian food store to find large pots like that. And they're excellent, yes. they're excellent and places cheap. to find and cheap too. And cheap, so. yes. Which is Definitely. good, particularly if you're taking it with you camping where you might break it. And that way if it was cheap, you won't cry so much. Yeah, I'm always panicked if my tagine breaks because it, this one was actually imported from Morocco by a friend of mine. So, Oof, yes. Pottery is fugitive. That is unfortunate, but true. If there, I have several several of my Pipkins that I'm quite fond of. I know someday they'll break and I'll be unhappy, but I'd rather just use them and enjoy them. I have done this for a feast, um, as I said, for a course, a course in a feast. And the funny thing about that one was that someone who is known for refusing to eat pork at events asked me in advance if there was pork in this. And I said, yes, of course there is. It's, you know, early modern Spanish food. It, everything has pig parts in it. And he said, oh, but I can't eat pig. But he came to the event, he ate the olo podrida. So, you know, you just tell people, it's like, okay, this is what's in it. You are an adult. You make your own decisions about what you eat. But I'm just telling you what this is. And you can decide to eat it or not eat it. There's a question. What's the smallest size pot that you would make this in? If you were, I'm maybe trying to make a smaller portion of it. I don't know if that's kind of possible. Well, um, I would probably, you know, if I was doing it at home, I'd do it in my stock pot. I could probably do it in my smaller stock pot and I, you know, have a, a chunk of cow, a chunk of pig, a half a chicken. You know, I could make a small-ish one, but there's just two in my household. My husband and I would have to, would end up, you know, eating this thing for a long time or just having lots of packages of it in the freezer. So one of the nice things to do if you have leftovers of this, the um, the ropa viejo, you know, the, the pull, sort of pulled cooked meat stew thing that's in a lot of um, 
South and Central American cuisines, which also makes a lovely filling for empanadas. It's a good thing to do with leftovers of this. And there's another chat question, which I think you answered, but I'll ask it again. If making this over an open fire, would a terracotta pot be the most appropriate cooking pot? Yes. Yes, that's, that's what I would use. Big ceramic pot. Though when I cook over fire, I tend to use ceramic pots as opposed to cast iron. Because um, when I cook over an open fire, I'm doing it at an SCA event and trying to do it as period as possible because I'm a food laurel and I have to set an example. And um, cast iron pots, as far as I know, in period, were used in China, not in Europe. So I use pottery. Somebody who knows more about cast iron may argue that point with me and I'm quite happy to listen to them about that. But as far as I know, only the Chinese were doing that in our time frame. And I realize that several of the recipes are outside our time frame. if you are as strict about the dates, um, but I'm not so strict about the dates. I figured that if it's still medieval or Renaissance aesthetic um, and we're not too far off of the dates, I'm okay with that. Other people may not be, and that's fine. Everybody gets to make their own choices. Okay, and we have four minutes left. Um, there was a comment of, from Liepa that said, I've successfully made a simple olla podrida in a 10-quart crock pot. Ah, very good. Very good. And it was yummy, no doubt. And added emphasis on simple, so... <laughs> <laughs> yes. I wonder if this is the sort of thing I could try in my Instapot because I tend to use that a lot in the summer because it's so hot. I don't want to turn on my oven or my stove. So I tend yeah. to use my, my Instapot quite a bit. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. I think it would be tight even in an eight quart, but yeah, as a cooking methodology, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or at least cook portions of, portions of it like... Here I have this hunk of cow. I want it to cook quicker. So when you get to the event, all the meat is prepared and you can put the meat in with the vegetables. So just doing the meat ahead of time so you're not simmering something forever, maybe right. at an event. I would not cook the meat separately though from one another because you're not going to get that broth that is the melded flavors. True, true. I mean, yeah, because most of the the period ones that do talk about cooking anything separately. It's pre-roasting some of the smaller birds um, and then sticking them in to stew with everything else. I think partially because they'll hold together better because small birds like some of the vegetables are, are less uh, hearty in terms of staying together when cooked in this sort of medium because they're small. And they have, you know, joints and stuff that will come apart, as opposed to just a hunk of cow's flesh or pig's flesh. But if you cook your meat ahead of time in the broth, and you save that broth and keep it with your meat, and you bring it and then cook everything else together, you do get your melted flavors. Well, you could make the whole all podrida at home, and then, you know, package it up and then reheat it at the event. Which is what I, to. which yeah. is what I would actually do because I'm a herald. I'm busy running here, there, and everywhere. Usually, exactly with my exactly. nose in a book or in the computer. I would lean towards um, actually reducing your stock if you were making it at home first, just to save yourself some packing space. And then you just have to add water on site. It's less weight to carry. If you freeze it, it's then less to heat up. You're not heating up this giant brick of Oya Podrida in yes. a, a campfire. Yes. And it's also, if you camp with a large group of people, 
the one person who is tasked with cooking dinner for everybody then can do this fairly easily and simply and feed the large lot of people while all of the other people in camp are doing whatever else they're doing, heralding or fighting or running classes or whatever. Um, so if you're, if you camp with a large group and you know, one night, one person's in charge, one person or just two people are in charge of the meal and you share it out that way. When it's your turn, you could do this. I hope everybody had fun and we'll make more yummy food.